Hello and welcome to our introduction to Raman spectroscopy. Before we go into details about the technique, I will give you some quick milestones of Raman spectroscopy. The story of Raman spectroscopy starts in 1923, when the Austrian physicists Michael predicted inelastic light scattering. The scattering was then experimentally demonstrated by C.V. Raman and his colleague Krishnan. For this breakthrough, Raman was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1930. The last milestone in Raman spectroscopy so far was reached in 1960 through the invention of lasers, which finally made Raman experiments reasonable. And here's why. Raman spectroscopy makes use of the interaction of the sample with the incident laser light, which is monochromatic, hence of a certain wavelength. The light can be absorbed, transmitted, or scattered. In scattered light, we differentiate between elastic or Rayleigh scattering and inelastic or Raman scattering. But what is the difference? Before we jump into the details, here are some basics you need to know. Molecules have different vibrational levels, which are defined by specific energy differences. The virtual state is a short-lived, unobservable state. In Rayleigh scattering, the laser photon excites the molecule into a virtual state. The molecule only stays in this state for a very short time. Then the molecule falls back to the ground state. In this process, the light gets scattered. The scattered light in this case has the same frequency as the incident light. This is Rayleigh or elastic scattering. As a side note, the general frequency corresponds to energy. Now, what about inelastic scattering? Just like in Rayleigh scattering, the laser frequency excites the molecule into a virtual state. Again, the molecule only remains in this state for a short time, but in contrast to Rayleigh scattering, falls to an excited state, not to the ground state. The light scattered in the process has a different frequency and thus energy than the incident light. This is the so-called Stokes-Raman scattering or Raman shift and serves as a fingerprint of the molecule. However, only one out of one million of scattering events yields a frequency different from the frequency of the incident laser light. One can also say that only one out of one million photons is Raman scattered. But wait, there is more, the anti-Stokes scattering. In this case, the laser frequency excites the molecule from an already excited state into a virtual state. When the molecule falls back to the ground state, the scattered light has more energy than the incident light, creating anti-Stokes scattering. The main focus in Raman spectroscopy, however, is typically on the Stokes scattered light. This is due to the fact that at room temperature, anti-Stokes scattering is less likely to happen compared to Stokes scattering. Now that we know how Raman scattering works, we will have a quick look at how a Raman spectrometer works. Here we see the setup of a typical Raman spectrometer. The laser creates a laser beam which is directed at a beam splitter. The light is then projected onto the sample through focusing optics. After passing a filter and another focusing optics, the beam is directed into the spectrometer and onto a lens and subsequently onto a grating. This splits the light into its different wavelengths, which are then detected by a CCD detector. This detector transforms the light into Raman lines. These Raman lines are what we usually later perceive as a Raman spectrum. The intensity of the band corresponds to how many Raman scattered photons reach the detector at the specific position. We have earlier heard of the Raman shift, but what exactly is that? The Raman shift corresponds to the energy and depends on the natural frequency of vibrations. These in turn depend on the mass of the molecule. Heavy molecules have long wavelengths and low frequency, just like in the oxygen molecule. Light molecules have shorter wavelengths and a higher frequency, like in the nitrogen molecule. When looking at Raman spectra of more complex substances, like aspirin and paracetamol, we see several so-called bands. 
This is because these molecules have more vibrational modes than simple molecules. Each of these modes, by the way, has its own natural frequency. The target of a Raman analysis is the measured material-specific pattern of the spectrum, the so-called Raman fingerprint. So now that we know how Raman spectroscopy works, let's have a look at two application examples for Raman. Brucker's handheld Raman spectrometer Bravo is the solution for incoming goods control and is dedicated to the pharmaceutical industry. The measurement is quick and easy and can be performed through packaging material. In case you need to measure a larger number of samples, the multi-RAM FT Raman spectrometer with the HTS stage is the right choice as it allows a fast, automated sample analysis. Last but not least, here we have an example of a Raman measurement with Bruker's Raman microscope Centera 2. It can be used to create high-resolution chemical maps of the sample surface. The distribution of active ingredients in tablets is an important application in the pharmaceutical industry. If the distribution is inhomogeneous, the medical efficiency of the tablet may be enhanced or limited. A chemical image was created and shows the distribution of the active ingredients in the tablet. Each color stands for a different ingredient, and we can see that the distribution is relatively homogeneous. With this, you got a quick guide through Raman spectroscopy. Hope you liked it, and see you next time.